Thank you, ladies. As far as I'm concerned, we could have the benediction and go home. That was a sermon in itself, wasn't it? Don't you want to go there? I don't want to miss the opportunity today, the day before Mother's Day, to just say something about our mothers. I believe that every one of us, if we get to heaven, it's going to be largely because of our mothers. Every time my sister that's four years older than me calls and talks to me, she, she says, you know, we had the best parents of anybody in the world. And I don't want to get into that argument because I know you had good parents too. But I had a good mother and a good dad. And I'm thankful for them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will come close to us today. May we see Jesus today because this is our prayer in his name. Amen. I want to start with 1 Corinthians 2.9, and I realize that Bob already read that to us, but I want to read it again. But it, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I'm sure that you have heard somebody say, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. And when I think about heaven and the things that God has prepared for us, I exclaim, can this really be true? And then I have to say, yes, by faith, it is. God has promised it. It is true. So when I started studying for this morning, I titled this, Is Heaven Real? And the more I studied, the more I realized that my title was wrong. It should be, Heaven is Real. In our Sabbath school last, class, one Sabbath last quarter, Peter Martin was asked the question when we were talking about the tree of life that Ellen White saw in vision, a tree on each side of the river of life. And she thought she saw two trees. And then she realized that it was joined together at the top. And Peter asked the question, can you imagine such a thing as that? And I said, yes, I can. Because when I was 15 years old, I saw two trees that the limb from one of them had grafted itself into the other one. I was working in the woods with my dad, and we could not get that tree to go down. And we finally realized, up there about 20 feet, this limb was grown into the other tree. We had to cut that tree, too, to get the first one to go down. If that can happen in nature, I don't think there's any problem with God creating the tree of life on both sides of the river joined at the top. And that river of life intrigues me. Having grown up in Oregon, where we had a lot of beautiful creeks and rivers and clear water, that pure river of life, I long to see it. I want to be there and drink from that river of life. But why do I want to go to heaven? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to start with the most important one. I'll end with the most important one. Isn't America good enough? It's the best country in the world, isn't it? But that's the problem. It's still in, on this earth. Thousands of people are coming, trying to come to this country because they think it's the best place in the world. But why do I want to go to heaven? Well, I'm tired. I'm tired of almost every day hearing about another mass shooting. I'm tired of hearing almost every day of another mass shooting of not only 
men and women, but of innocent children. I'm tired of hearing of the horrors of war, and the, most of the people that are fighting these wars don't even know what they're fighting for. I'm tired of saying goodbye to our loved ones. Forgive me. Who have closed their eyes in death. Four of my eight siblings now sleep in Jesus, and a fifth one is on hospice. And just a couple of days ago, I got word that a good friend of mine had passed away on May 2. I'm tired of this. I want to go home. I'm tired of the ravages of disease that leave people disfigured and crippled. Would you say, Frank, you're just plain tired? I don't think I'm the only one. But more important, I want to see Jesus. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. And that boggles my mind. I can't even wrap my mind around eternity. He's done so much for me. Why shouldn't I love him? How could I not love him? I'll even have hair again. <laughs> you know, when Jesus comes, my glasses, my hearing aids, my arthritis, all my aches and pains are going to be gone. Instantly. Praise the Lord. No more pain. It's going to be great. Gone forever. But let's look at some of the things now that God will give us in place of these things that I've been saying I'm t tired of. Let's look at Revelation 21. Verses 4 to 6. And yes, I realize that I'm mixing heaven and the new earth together because some of these things are promised in the new earth, but how can you separate them? And Revelation 21, verses 4 through 6. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. I grew up with a beautiful creek running about 50 feet from our house. Beautiful, clear, sparkling water. In fact, we didn't even have refrigeration. The creek was our refrigerator until I was 16, 17 years old. But I liked that sparkling water. Verse 6 of Revelation 21 said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Think about it. Those who overcome will be sons and daughters of God. Adopted sons and daughters of God, adopted in his, into his family. In my trade, the word shall, according to the definitions in the Oregon Plumbing Code, is a mandatory term. That means if I'm an overcomer, I am, I have to be God's son. What do you think of that? I like that. I have an adopted daughter. 
Margaret doesn't. She gave birth to this girl. But the way I understand the law of adoption, I cannot disown that girl. I can disown my biological children. Why would I want to? But I cannot disown her. We are sons and daughters of God forever. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That tells me all the evil that's in, that we know in this world will be gone. What a day. I have a sister-in-law that likes to worry. She's always worried about something, and I tell her, you don't need to worry. Most of the stuff we worry about never happens. And she says, that's what I worry about. keeps it from happening. I don't think that's the way it works. <laughs> but there will be no more wars, no more mass shootings, no more hungry children going to bed at night, no more death, crying or tears. And I'm sure that you're tired of all that stuff as well. But how do we get there? How can I get there? Well, we talked about our GPS this morning, our guidebook, and we have some answers there. Let's look at John 14, verse 5. In the Gospel of John, John tells us that Thomas had said to Jesus, we don't know where you're going. And this is Jesus' response. John 14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, how do we know where you are going? How can we know? We do not know the, where you are going. How can we know the way? Talk about needing to know the way. All we need to do is follow Jesus, isn't it? He's been there before. You know, when I retired, my crew gave me a GPS. And it was pretty good, but it wasn't always accurate. If I put in our address out here, it would take me to the north side of the freeway, and we live on the south side of the freeway. But the guidebook, the GPS that God has given us is always right. And let's look at John 14, verses 6 and 7. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye would have known my Father also, and henceforth you know him and have seen him. That's really kind of simple, isn't it? All we need to know to do is know the Father and the Son and follow them. In John 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Well, you heard me tell the children that I started life on a farm. Pasture was important for those cows. If we didn't have pasture, we weren't going to get the milk. But the call to come through the door is universal. The door is open to all who desire to enter. He or she who wishes can enjoy those privileges of sal that salvation offers. Salvation offers protection, safety, security, and peace, as well as food for the soul.
I, I just long for that day when we can go home. And Paul, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, this is important. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what is a gift? Do I deserve it? Probably not. Can I earn it? If I earn it, it isn't the gift, is it? You know, <clears throat> I have a friend that needed a drill. And I had three DeWalt <clears throat> four-pack <coughs> cordless tools, sets of tools. And so I took one over to him one day and I wanted to give it to him. He wouldn't let me give it to him. He insisted he had to pay for it. I wanted to give it to him. Well, we're still friends, even though, and he did take, take it, but he had to pay me for it. God says salvation is a gift. God wants to give us salvation. We can't pay for it. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But for it to be worth anything, I have to accept it. Let's do an imaginary conversation in heaven, and I do not believe this will happen, but let's play with it anyway. Suppose that we get to heaven and someone recognizes the thief that was crucified with Jesus, and they say, hey, aren't you a thief? Yes. Then how did you get here? Can you explain the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel? No. Do you understand justification by faith and salvation by grace through faith? I never heard of those. Well, then how did you get here? Well, the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's the only way you and I are going to get there. If the man on the cro middle cross says we can go there. In this instance, in this case, I believe that who you know is more important than what you know. Now, please don't leave here and say, Frank doesn't think the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are important. I think they're vitally important. But the doctrines that we hold so dear without Jesus Christ and without love for God and love for our fellow man is worthless. It took me a long time to realize that, but thank God he, the Holy Spirit finally got through to me and said, Frank, there's some things you still need to understand. And there still are some things I need to understand. But Jesus is the most important thing in this universe. Let's look at Matthew twenty-two thirty-five 35 to 40. A lawyer came to Jesus one day. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. And then Jesus went on and he said, 
And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Pharisees exalted the first four commandments above the last six. But Jesus listing the various parts of the body was his way of saying, if love for God is present, it will permeate every aspect of the being. Obedience without love is not only impossible, but worthless if we were able to do it. And I submit to you this morning that I cannot obey, truly obey, without love. Loving our neighbor as ourselves widens the definition to include all who need our help. Remember, a man came to Jesus and asked him who his neighbor was. And Jesus told him a story. The story that we call the story of the Good Samaritan. And when he was done, he said, Now who was neighbor to the man that fell among thieves? And this man wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. He said, Him that showed mercy on him. But in saying on, in saying on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, Jesus was affirming that the Old Testament was nothing more or nothing less than the two great principles, love for God and love for our fellow man. Yes, I agree. Sometimes it's hard to love some of our fellow men. Sometimes I have to ask the Lord to give me that love but he's always faithful and he will do it. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And usually when we talk about that, we want to talk about keeping the Sabbath. But I think just as important as keeping the Sabbath is loving our fellow man. So my friends, the only way any of us are going to get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ and loving obedience. You and I can't earn salvation. We can't buy it. It is a gift. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Let's sing about it in hymn number 428.